Good morning and welcome to Farm Factor. I'm your host, Jamie Bloom. On today's show, Kyle Bauer first visits with Julia Devis, the Communications Director for the National Sorghum Producers. Next, enjoy our weekly Kansas soybean update. Then Kyle is back with Martin Kirshen, a Sedgwick County farmer who also works with the Sorghum Checkoff. And then it's this week's Kansas Farm Bureau update. After that, we'll learn how commercial DNA scans make genetic change quicker in the beef cattle business, and we'll end today's show with another episode of Plain Talk. Closed captioning brought to you by Ag Promo Source. Together we grow. Learn more at agpromosource.com. This segment brought to you by Kansas Wheat. Learn more at rediscoverwheat.org. Welcome to Farm Factor. First, Kyle Bauer and Julia Devis discuss the EPA's regulatory review process for atrazine. Hi, this is Kyle Bauer. I have the opportunity to visit with Julia Debus. She is a communications director for the National Sorghum Producers. Um, Julia, what sort of issues or projects are you working on with the uh, National Sorghum Producers? Hi, good morning, Kyle. Uh, one of the biggest issues that we are working on and tracking right now is the regulatory review process with the Environmental Protection Agency with regard to crop protection products. So, sounds absolutely not sexy, but something that's really important to the farm when we talk about how the Environmental Protection Agency is fundamentally changing how they're playing the game of conducting these registration reviews for chemicals like atrazine, chlorpyrifos, and others. You know, literally, I graduated from high school in 1980, and in 1981, I had the opportunity to serve on an atrazine task force in 1981, and all these years later, we're still talking about it. Absolutely. You know, atrazine is one of the most widely studied, widely used chemicals that we have in our toolbox. We have more than 50 years of use, more than 7,000 scientific studies demonstrating its safety. Yet again, at the EPA, it is currently coming under attack as part of its regular 15-year cycle registration review. That process should be pretty straightforward, but unfortunately, the EPA is playing some games with it. You mentioned regular review. I think there's a lot of people don't realize that, that after something is approved by EPA, uh, there's still constant uh, supervision of those products. Absolutely, and that's one of the strengths of the science-based system in the United States is that every 15 years, every agrochemical undergoes a registration review process to update environmental standards, to look at efficacy, to see how these chemicals are having an impact in the environment, how they're being used, and are supposed to be having a risk-benefit process that's going undergoing. Unfortunately, in this latest round of registration reviews, the EPA is choosing solely to focus on risk, and even more particular, they're focusing on a hazard number within that risk, meaning if I go outside, I could get a sunburn. That's a hazard. But when we look at risk, if I go outside and I put on sunscreen, then I'm less likely to have a sunburn. Unfortunately, EPA is focusing solely on that hazard component and not really taking a lot of other factors into consideration. And truly, with atrazine being around for more than 50 years, at, at that point, it was parts per million. Now they have the opportunity to measure down to parts per billion. Absolutely. So uh, EPA's own scientific advisory panels have set the level of that parts per billion even higher than it is currently allowed. However, in the proposed analysis, EPA is ignoring their own scientific panels and proposing lowering that threshold down to 3.4 parts per billion. And if you translate that over to application rates, that would take it down from your atrazine application of one to two pounds per acre to about a quarter of a pound of acre, about eight fluid ounces, so less than a drink glass, which effectively renders the product useless on most sorghum makers. We're visiting with Julia Debus. She is with the National Sorghum Producers. This is Kyle Bauer reporting. Back to you, Jamie. Thanks, Kyle. Folks, come back after these messages for this week's Kansas Soybean Update.
Soil is the life of a farm, and for 25 years, SureCrop Liquid Crop Nutrition has helped growers produce abundant quality crops while preserving and improving the soils they steward. SureCrop offers complete soil and plant analysis with cropping recommendations, delivery direct to your on-farm storage, and quality crop nutrition custom blended for your field. Choose SureCrop for the assurance of excellence for your soil. Call today or visit their website for more information. Buying a car shouldn't be this hard. And at Brown Chevrolet Buick in Wamego, it isn't. It's actually awesome. Whether you want a new or used car or truck, Toby's team can make the deal. Even if you want to custom order a new car or truck, Toby's team can make the deal. See Toby's team at Brown Chevrolet Buick in Wamego. We're awesome. This segment is brought to you by the Kansas Soybean Commission. The Soybean Checkoff, progress powered by Kansas farmers. Welcome back to Farm Factor and the Kansas Soybean Update. Bill Johnson, so, professor of weed science at Purdue University, joins us. And Bill, you have been one of the leaders in developing and promoting the United Soybean Board's Take Action Herbicide Resistance Resources. Why is that so important right now for producers to see this information? I think it's important for all of us to understand that herbicide resistance now is certainly an issue that's affecting many farming operations. It's a national threat to our corn and soybean production acres, also to our wheat production acres. It's growing very rapidly rapidly in the Midwest and the Plain State. Many of our farmers have gotten used to utilizing a single herbicide, glyphosate, and now because of resistance issues, we're having to adopt more complicated and costly strategies. And what we're trying to do is help the grower adjust to these strategies and also maintain high yields in a profitable crop production system. And in this case, too, it's also an, a, really a partnership between folks like yourself at Purdue University, the herbicide providers, and in this case, soybeans, as far as what they're wanting to do to manage herbicide resistant weeds? Yes, that's correct. Originally, this was driven by the fact that there were many academics working on this topic. And as herbicide resistant weed problems started to infest more and more soybean acres, our soybean grower leadership was proactive in going out and providing some support for us to work more collaboratively together, both from the academic standpoint and with industry to help uh, bring the message to growers on how to manage weeds better. And so having the funding support from the soybean checkoff is been very instrumental in developing the brand or the logo and certainly in distributing the information that, that we produce at the university. So if they go to the website, takeactiononweeds.com, that's some of the things they're going to find there is that type of information? We have a series of printed guide sheets available for control of specific weeds on how to use glyphosate more effectively, on how to use other herbicides more effectively, the economics of weed resistance. So there's a number of one-page fact sheets on that. There's also access to many of the state's resources, such as their weed control guides and weed identification guide. And then the other thing that we're doing with that funding as well is we are conducting demonstration plots in every state that is getting funding for this. So we're doing these summer demonstration plots at sites that have herbicide resistant weeds. And then we're also following up with winter meetings too, which are funded by these checkoff dollars. What's the website they can go to to get all this information? Take action on weeds. Bill, we appreciate your time. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you. That is Bill Johnson, professor of weed science at Purdue University, our guest on the Kansas Soybean Update. It's brought to you by the Kansas Soybean Commission. The Soybean Checkoff, progress powered by Kansas farmers. Learn more at kansassoybeans.org. For Kansas Soybeans, I'm Greg Akagi. Hope you enjoyed this week's Kansas Soybean Update. Stay with us after the break for more Farm Factor. Biodiesel made from sustainable resources is diversifying our fuel supply. This year, biodiesel will displace over a billion gallons of fossil fuel nationwide. It's making our economy stronger and our communities healthier. It's working here and across America. Get biodiesel going in your community. Visit americasadvancedbiofuel.com. Valley Vet Supply is devoted to providing information and professional quality products at reasonable prices. Valley Vet Supply. This segment brought to you by Kansas Grain Sorghum. Growers working together. 
Find out more at kansasgrainsorghum.org. We're back with Kyle and Martin Kirshen, who explains how the sorghum checkoff works for producers. Hi, this is Kyle Bauer. I have the opportunity to visit with Martin Kirshen. Martin is um, with the um, sorghum checkoff, but he's also a farmer. Let's start, Martin, with telling about your farming operation. Um, we're from South Central Kansas. Our operation, went along with my son and son-in-law and my wife, um, we have 2,500 acres of dry land, and it's in a sorghum, soybean, and wheat rotation. And what county is that? That's in Sedgwick County. And you have you work with the sorghum checkoff. There's other organizations in sorghum. Tell us about the difference between the checkoff and some of the other organizations that people serve on. Well, the sorghum checkoff, uh, we take producers' dollars and invest them in um, in research, in uh, renewables, and in exports to try to bring more value to to our product. And um, where we work together. We're working, doing a better job of working together with the state organizations also because uh, we all need to get these prices and get these piles of grain used up. So um, we do research. Uh, we have three different committees, crop improvement. We're still working on that, but I think we all know with the rain we've had, crop improvement's been pretty decent this past year and last year. So. You know, transportation is a huge issue when it comes to sorghum, uh, and you're working on that constantly. Yes, um, you know, we're trying, we're here today, I think, trying to work on relationships with other industries, and the railroad industry is a big plus for us because um, to try to get the sorghum out of Kansas is, a much, is much more difficult than if you was down by the port. And one of the ways we're trying to do that is by using containers. We get, our, sp specifically, sorghum is, we get calls, I get calls from, um, companies in Chicago wanting containers and we only have one container loading facility in Kansas right now down at Edgerton, Gardner Edgerton and I think hopefully after today with some action plans we'll get one or two more of those and that'll help the sorghum and it'll help all the, cro all the crops in Kansas. You know, we, we don't want to just be specific to sorghum because we know high tide raises all ships like Kerry Weefald always says and uh, so um, we're, we're just looking to grow our industry and get profitability for our producer. That's what the sorghum checkoff is. We invest dollars to get producer profitability. When it comes to sorghum, Kansas is a major player, not the major player, but one of the biggest players in the nation. Well, Kansas is the largest producer of sorghum. Uh, Texas ranks second. And so we, it's a valuable crop for us. In western Kansas, it's going to get more valuable with their water issues, and if these those guys are going to have to use it in rotation. And in south central Kansas, in our dry line operations with the, with the pig weeds and everything else, that's why we rotate now. And sorghum fits in good with those rotation, doesn't build up resistance that way to chemicals. And so I think there's a great future for sorghum as long as we can get the price up a little bit for our producers. We're visiting with Martin Kirshen. He is with the Sorghum Checkoff. This is Kyle Bauer reporting. Back to you, Jamie. Thanks, Kyle. Stay tuned for the Kansas Farm Bureau update coming up next. The new Better Horses Network is worldwide. Presented by Lucas Oil. Featuring worldwide radio and TV with iconic hosts like Al Dunning, Sharon Camarillo, Ernie Rodina, Lindy Birch, and Craig Cameron. With American Cowboy, Horse and Rider, Brushy Creek, Cavenders, and Ride TV. Worldwide Radio and TV, the all new Better Horses Network. This segment brought to you by Kansas Corn. Learn more at kscorn.com. Welcome back to Farm Factor and the Kansas Farm Bureau update. Daniel Quist is the Senior Counsel for Public Policy with the American Farm Bureau Federation, and she said it's a big win for agriculture. Frankly, it's a big win for privacy in the Internet world, for all citizens. The Eighth Circuit ruled that when you have personal information, like your home address, your 
phone number, your email address, even like for farmers and ranchers, when you actually live on the farm, that that's still considered personal information. It's, you still have a substantial privacy interest in that information, even when it can be found here and there on the internet. The court said that type of information is not subject to mandatory disclosure under the Freedom of Information Act because it's protected by Exemption 6, which is for personal and medical information. EPA was in the process of gathering this type of information about poultry and livestock producers from state regulators, and several groups made FOIA requests for the information. And EPA collected the information from the states and handed it to them in a very large database that contains personal information about tens and thousands of livestock and poultry producers from 29 states. We didn't learn about it until after the information had been released. EPA didn't talk to us anybody in the agricultural world, and they certainly didn't ask the people whose personal phone numbers were on those lists if they were okay with this release. AFBF and the National Pork Producers Council filed a lawsuit against the EPA when they found out the agency was about to release more information on farmers from another seven states. So what's next in the case? What to do with the data that's already out there? It's been released now for three years. When we brought it to their attention that we believe that they violated FOIA, they did a recall of the data from the requesters. And then they did a, a, what we thought was a very narrow review for privacy purposes and then did another release. And then they actually recalled some data again. They've shown that they can recall this data from the FOIA requesters. And we expect as a first step that that will, what is what they will do next. She said the American Farm Bureau will continue to work to ensure that personal information about farmers and ranchers is not disclosed by the EPA. Chad Smith in Washington. Stay with us to learn about genomic tests to benefit beef cattle genetics. Kansas Farm Bureau, the voice of agriculture, represents grassroots agriculture. The state's largest and most powerful farm organization stands up for its members through leadership development, agriculture education, legal defense, environmental advocacy, farm safety, and risk management. Members also enjoy money-saving benefits. To join our organization today or to learn more, go to www.kfb.org or find us on Facebook and Twitter person who's involved in ag production and cattle, cattle ranching, Bill Rischel here in North Platte, told me about Kansas Regenerative Medicine. And after talking to Dr. Pope, we did a lot of reading and researching, looking on the internet about it. I guess the thing that impressed me is that he told me, he said, if we don't think it's going to help you, we're not, we're not going to do it. I thought that was a, a very good approach. I'm a former uh, athlete, played college basketball, played overseas after college, had some severe trauma on the right ankle, right knee, joint in my hand also. This brace is what I had to wear all the time. Now I don't wear this during the day. That's a real improvement for me. Uh, my knee uh, doesn't bother me. Um, this joint came around quick. Um, it was the first thing I noticed improving. You can see in the background here, there's different fish and game that I hunt. The ability to walk was impacting my outdoor uh, endeavors. I think it's really, vi really viable and I encourage anybody that's interested to go down and at least do a consultation with them. This segment brought to you by Kansas Farm Bureau, the voice of agriculture. To join today or more information, go to kfb.org or find us on Facebook and Twitter. Welcome back. Let's see how commercial DNA scans in beef cattle make genetic changes quicker. More information for the same price. Zoetis recently started reporting individual traits on its commercial genomics test for Angus cattle. We think that it will give uh, some commercial cow-calf users of GeneMax advantage, particularly those in challenging environments, more flexibility to put added emphasis on things like heifer pregnancy and calving ease maternal. That added flexibility through technology means greater cost effectiveness. It's um, all of the same and these added individual trait features for the same price. And a couple of other things then that are incorporated will have the very latest version 5 marker effects which will describe more variation than ever before for all the traits and the indexes. And we also then will be benchmarking all the animals against all of the tested population of commercial Angus, which now totals over 37,000 head. So it's some um, better benchmarking uh, from better marker effects and 
more precision in selection and mating through the reporting of individual trait predictions. Angus breeders have tested more than 220,000 animals and the results add accuracy. And then on the defensive side of the game plan, it's uh, a matter of GMAX advantage then being the tool of choice to select the ones that will make the most money, be the most profitable over their lifetimes and also know then best what to breed them to to accentuate their strengths and, the, and to correct their weaknesses. Applying the technology leads to increasingly better cows that produce increasingly better calves and premium beef for consumers. I'm Bob Cervera. Come back after these messages from our sponsors for this week's Plain Talk. When your living depends on agriculture, you can depend on KFRM 550 AM. If you're in the southwest three-fourths of Kansas or the northern half of Oklahoma, catch us at 550 AM on the radio dial. But if that isn't you, listen on your cell phone at TuneIn Radio or on your computer at KFRM.com. We promise to keep you informed, entertained, and company as you go through your day. KFRM 550 AM, the voice of the plains. We would like to join your management team. This segment brought to you by Kansas Corn. Learn more at kscorn.com. We're back with Farm Factor in this week's Plain Talk with Kyle and Dwayne Taves. Hi, this is Kyle Bauer with Dwayne Taves. See, well, I'm trying to say it was, much more calmly. It was a little melodramatic that time. Well, it's like you don't like it when I'm too... Make a big fanfare and then you... And it, you got to hit the medium. You got to hit the sweet spot. On in the average, there. it is good. <laughs> On the, the average, old bucket of hot water, bucket of cold water. The average is good. There you go. Yeah. Your fact or fiction, Kyle Bauer? Question of the day. It's kind of interesting. I've got some weddings coming up in my family. Unfortunately, part of I get to pay for. Not overly excited about that. I can tell. <laughs> Originally, bridesmaids You're not were hiding it very well. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Sorry, girls. Originally, bridesmaids. We're not there for moral support, but to confuse evil spirits, fact huh. or fiction. Now, I had understood early on groomsmen were there to protect the bri or the groom from from the, all the I, other guys. Well, I that think, were wanting the bride. I think it was the bride's family. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> nothing like protecting him from the in-laws. Yeah, so. <laughs> That's not a good sign. <laughs> That's hmm. like. You the, picked bad if you need protection the from the best advice I ever got. I was 18 years old sitting in the Morganville Cafe huh? and sitting there next to Roy Meek. Mm -hmm. And Roy Meek said, you know, when you, when you boys get married, you think you're marrying that pretty little thing standing next to you. Mm -hmm. You're really marrying all the people sitting behind her in church. <laughs> yeah. Tell you what, changed my point of view the rest of my life. Yeah. And in fact, every wedding I've gone to since. Mind I've you, looked at the people. <laughs> I got some marriage advice from my high school or from my college judging team coach. All right. And um, when I was at Hutchinson Community College, he uh, said, uh, "You know, it'd be a pretty good idea if you took a real good hard look at mom while you're dating, because that's a pretty good indication of just exactly who you're going to be living with forty years down the road." I wouldn't call it exactly. Well, a somewhat indication. A fair indicator. Yeah. Well, we in animal agriculture. It's genetic. We, we understand. It's the genetic yeah. thing. Good, and bad, or indifferent. The maternal seems to carry through much stronger than the paternal. Yeah, what are EDPs, right? Is EPDs. What it, EPDs. Yeah, yeah, the EPD on the maternal side is very strong, right? Correlation is good. Yeah. So there freedom freedom tax day. Tax oh. freedom day by state. You know, I don't really understand that. Well, seems it's like you take taxes out of my check all the way through the end of the year. Well, it isn't exactly legal, but you haven't caught on, so. <laughs> okay. <laughs> there was supposed to be a tax freedom day. Yeah. Oh. So it's like, no, this is how far you got to work for the year to pay the taxes in that particular state. And all the rest of the year, all those earnings Go are to you. yours. Oh, you get okay. to keep it. Right. How far into the year did we get this year? Well, according to Kansas, is is April 9th. But interestingly enough, Okay. Uh, Texas is April 10th. I mean, I'd say it's insignificant. That's pretty close. Oklahoma is April 6th. Still, Come on. Still probably not statistically Nebraska's different. Nebraska's April 12th. Uh, Missouri's April 8th. Iowa's April 9th. Uh, South Dakota's April 4th. I mean, we're all just right together to here together within a week of it. It's all about the same. Well, all of your federal tax would be the same. Yes. 
So, so then, then you'd it's have late and state, local and state. Right. Thanks for joining us. I'm your host, Jamie Bloom, and I hope you enjoyed today's show. See you next week on Farm Factor. We're here every Tuesday on Ag AM in Kansas. Closed captioning brought to you by Ag Promo Source. Together we grow. Learn more at agpromosource.com.